Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Redefining Work podcast. I'm your host, Lars Schmidt. And today we're going to be talking about HR. Now, we always talk about HR. That's not anything necessarily new, but we're going to be talking about HR at a scale that very few people leaders get to operate in. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by Donna Morris. Donna is the EVP and Chief People Officer at a company you've probably heard of called Walmart. And we're going to get into the complexities of HR innovation at a global scale that is really not matched by any companies out there. So Donna, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Um, I would love to have you open up with an introduction for our audience. Sounds great. Thanks very much for having me, Lars. And it's wonderful to join everyone today. My name is Donna Morris, and I'm fortunate to be Chief People Officer at Walmart. I joined Walmart in February 2020, just before the pandemic became our reality here in the United States. In fact, the pandemic had already hit our operations in China. And uh, what drew me to was this Walmart was two big things. One, the size, scale, and the opportunity to impact people's lives. We have 2.1 million associates that call Walmart their workplace. And the opportunity to contribute to digital transformation. We're on an incredible journey. And in fact, it was expedited during the pandemic by virtue of the need to serve customers and members, curbside, delivery, etc. So it's been an exciting time. I have more than three decades of experience. Yes, I'm a dinosaur, Lars, in uh, human resources. I'm originally from Ottawa, Canada, and I moved to California in 2002 and previously was chief human resources officer at Adobe in San Jose. Okay. Well, I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions about Walmart, but before we get to Walmart, I want to actually take you back to your Adobe days. And as you mentioned, you spent 17 years there in a variety of HR leadership roles, including, you know, running all of HR before moving over to Walmart. And I'm curious, you know, an organization like Adobe that is such, uh, it's known for enabling designers and powering so many incredible design tools. And you know, I, I'm a, a, a self-professed design you know, nerd. If I had to come back in another career, it would be as a designer. So I have no design skills, but a deep appreciation and affinity for design. And I'm curious, how did running you know, HR programs and products and ultimately all of HR in a company like Adobe shape the way that you think about bringing design into your talent and people strategy? Well, what a great question. Um, for one, let me start by saying Adobe is an incredible company and uh, that has rich products that almost have a cultural following to them. And uh, I was able to amass a lot of insights as it relates to technology in my time there. And frankly, I learned a lot more than I perhaps even gave myself credit for. Um, and uh, when I left and joined Walmart, what I realized is over the many years that I worked at Adobe, I started to have a really strong affinity for the experience layer and how people experience digital, whether that be an associate, which is an employee, whether that be a customer, whether that be a member. And so what I find myself really particular about is what that experience is like, whether that be digital and or physical, but it started with that digital aspect. I'll, I'll tell you, Lars, I cannot handle anything that is like clip art because that would be <laughs> a, a, you know, a destroyer to anybody who's a real designer. Yeah. And uh, so I find myself really in tuned. And in fact, today I'm fortunate to have the people product team become part of the overall global people team. I was also really fortunate to be a key contributor to driving what we call my assistant, which is a generative AI capability within MIAT. MIAT is um, an app that now really uh, is across a number of our core markets that allows us to take over 300 disparate systems, stitch them all together with a rich front end to allow associates to navigate their work and their life. And so simply put, I think once you get on to the fact that design and experience is part of everything that we do, you really start to live it. And then I would say the other uh, takeaway that I had from my time with Adobe and, and working in a very rich creative environment is it truly is humanity and creativity and empathy that cannot be replaced by technology. So in fact, technology can aid people in being more human, in being more creative, in being more empathetic. And I believe that I carried that from my time working at Adobe. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, it's so interesting that I'm I'm chuckling uh, still about the clip art comment because I think uh, you know the the world that we're in right now, design matters, and and I think when you look at the toolkit of HR. It's grown exponentially over the last even five years, where our ability to communicate on different platforms, our ability to think visually and, and, and communicate visually and convey ideas um, beyond, you know, rough PowerPoint decks, um, that matters and it impacts our ability to influence and really get our message across. Um, I, w one more question I had for you around your experience at Adobe, because I think that we've ha seen a lot of conversations lately around performance reviews. And, you know, what's the right cadence? How should they be structured? And you actually took that farther to say, should they even happen? And scrapped performance reviews while at Adobe. And I'm, I'd love to just get behind the scenes and, you know, take, take you back to that moment in time as you're evaluating, like, what was the, what was the information that kind of got you to the point where to say, you know what, this isn't really additive to the business. And then what was the impact once you actually did away with them? You know, Lars, it's quite a period of time. It's almost 15 years since I made that decision. And uh, in fact, it was ideation at the time. It was discussions that I was having together with an incredible team that I got to work with. And we were talking about the importance of setting objectives, giving feedback and making sure that there were rich career development discussions. And uh, I traveled to India. I was incredibly jet lagged. I was interviewed by the Economic Times, which is a major periodical in India. And I was asked uh, a question for which I got a little defensive, which was, you know, basically what is HR doing to take friction? That's my term out of um, organizations. And I said, oh, we're going to abolish the performance reviews. And next thing you know, they wanted to make that like front page. And I immediately had to get in touch with my boss, who's the CEO and, you know, hadn't thought through all the details yet. So luckily it was, an, it was not a career limiting move, but it was a catalyst for us to really spark a discussion and a dialogue with our associates. And, um, you know, once again, this was 14 years ago. So I took to a blog, which I wrote and published to our employees asking, what did they think if we got rid of ranking and rating? And what if we went to really an evergreen process that was all about their performance? And it led to really very effective outcomes. One is the organization became more team oriented, less individual oriented. Two is it became more of an ongoing mechanism, just like you're running your business. You were running your performance, you were running your objectives, which was really, really good. And I would say third was there were no surprises. It wasn't that dreaded time of the year where you're going to have to sit down, you're going to have to talk about your performance. Really what you want to find out is how you're getting paid and if you feel like that aligns to what your objectives are. So um, I'm really proud of collectively what we accomplished at that point in time, but transparency Lars is it's highly dependent upon managerial effectiveness and it's highly effective on the ability to really set objectives, give feedback and have career development discussions. So observation, you can do that if you're of a certain scale. You can't do that when you're of the scale of Walmart. It just doesn't work. And, yeah. you know, think of it as um, having a school where there's a le lexicon or a rubric for grading. The bigger the school, the more variation that there likely is between grading systems. And I think when you're actually in a larger enterprise, you need some more structure to actually ensure that discussions are having around objectives, around feedback and career development. But nonetheless, I'm excited about what we did. And, and equally here at Walmart, we're doing some really exciting things to support our associates and frankly, the enterprise and our managers and leaders. Yeah, and I'll have a lot of questions there, particularly around um, some of your sprints on generative AI and how you're deploying that. But I want to I want to take you back in time a little bit, and I know it's it's difficult to ask people to go back to Q1 of 2020 because that was an incredibly challenging time for all of humanity. But it was a uniquely challenging time for you as a as a new chief people officer moving into a Fortune one company in the early days of an unprecedented global pandemic having to onboard as a new people leader while you know being very hands-on obviously and helping walmart adapt to what was happening around the world what was that experience like for you like i just want to get a sense of like just you know there's so i mean onboarding as an executive is hard 
onboarding as an executive in a Fortune 500 company has its own complexities, complexities, let alone, you know, Fortune 1. But doing that with the backdrop of an unprecedented global pandemic is is something else. And so I'd love to just like walk me through, like, what was that experience like for you? <laughs> well, I think, Laura, sometimes uh, what you don't know is better than what you do know. <laughs> Meaning, I think if I had known that I was making such a large career move and that the backdrop was going to be something that uh, truly um, has come and will become something very historic for a period of time. Frankly, I think it would have gotten cold feet. And, uh, you know, my outcomes today would be very different than what it is. But what I would say is it was a crisis period of time that required people to come together. And so I think it actually escalated and expedited my onboarding. I had to get to know people really quickly because we needed to do um, a number of actions together to really secure our ability to serve our customers and our members, and most importantly, safeguard the well-being of our associates. And so, you know, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. It was a crisis. And uh, it's hard now for me to imagine how I would have onboarded as quickly if it wasn't for a crisis, if that makes sense. Um, and, uh, you know, it seemed like it was a, a rolling crisis because we had the pandemic. We had the tragic murder of George Floyd. At that period of time, our operations here in the U.S. were heavily impacted. In fact, one of our stores was burnt entirely to the ground. It really required us to have a lot of leadership specific to racial equity. You know, Walmart represents America. And so it wasn't just the pandemic. But it was the pandemic, it was racial injustices, it was civil and civic injustices when you think of um, what happened on the Capitol on January 6th. There was a sequence of ongoing activities. Yeah. There was what do we do with masks? What do we do with vaccines? What do we do with mandates? Um, but all of that required us to be really, really specific about what our overall priorities were. And we determined that there would be four pillars and those four pillars are still our foundation today. We were going to focus on digital. We were going to focus on the growth of our associates. We were going to focus on their well-being and we were going to create a culture of belonging. And those are as important to us today in almost the start of 2024, as they were in May 2020, when we announced and shared them to the Global People team. And so what I would say is what I learned was onboarding in a crisis can actually expedite your ability to make impact and build relationships. Two is um, you're, you're going to know if you're a fit early on when you're in a situation like that. And, you know, sometimes it takes people a long time to figure out, is this the place I need to be? I found out very, very quickly that the people I got to work with aligned with my values and that this would be a place that I would feel my best, that I could be my authentic self, which was really, really important. And third, I couldn't call out a better CEO on the planet than the CEO that I get to work with. So, um, you know what, it was a crisis, but we used it as an opportunity. Yeah. I mean, that's such a good point around how that accelerated everything, right? I mean, in terms of like our practices, our ability to shift to remote and hybrid work where we could, but the onboarding is a new leader, the, the, the general process of building that, those relationships and that trust, especially with your C-suite peers, takes time, right? It's earned. And when you're in a crisis like that, you, you have to be much more receptive and open and, and, and the way that you communicate, I mean, everything. So I can, I can see how that really just helped you kind of, uh, you know, hit the ground running. I don't even know that if that accurately describes it, but, uh, but, you know, just getting in and, and getting on. Um, I imagine most of our audience is familiar with Walmart, probably customers of Walmart, but they may not know the inner workings of Walmart. And so I'd love to have you just give an overview of, you mentioned, you know, over two point, over 2 million, uh, employees, uh, I'd love to just give an overview again, you know, company size, uh, global footprint, and then a bit of an overview of your people team um, and how they're structured to support that. Absolutely. Walmart is a people led, tech powered, omni channel retailer that exists to help people save money so that they can live better. We do have more than 2.1 million associates cut across three operating segments 
Walmart US. Those are the stores that you might see. Walmart.com would be our e-commerce business. We have a growing digital advertising business that we call Walmart Connect. We have a very large health and wellness business. We have a financial services business all within Walmart US. We have our Sam's Club business here in the US. That's home to our Sam's Clubs. And that is a member-based warehouse club for individuals to buy great items in clubs and or online. And then we have a very strong international business that operates in 19 different markets. And across those markets, we go by a number of different banners. So we go by Walmart, we go by Sam's, we go by Bodegas in Walmex. We are the backers behind Flipkart and PhonePay in India. We're in China. We're MassMart in Africa. We're in Chile. We're in Canada as Walmart Canada. And so what you find within our enterprise in combination with the three operating segments are very large corporate functions, the largest being our global technology organization. We have more than 30,000 individuals that call Global Tech their home. They build technology tools for our customers, our members, and to run the enterprise, including our associate experience. And then you have home to our corporate affairs and communications teams, our finance teams, our governance teams, and our global people team. Our global people team serves those segments and those functions, and it also consists of individuals that lead our centers of excellence. And so reporting into myself, I have three CPOs that run respectively each of those segments. And then I have a CPO that runs the corporate functions. I have a partner as it relates to people for people. And then we have our rewards leader, our talent leader, our learning and leadership leader, somebody who leads associate and labor relations somebody that leads people product. And then I have a partner in terms of strategy and innovation. And our people team is around three, I guess around 3,500 individuals. Uh, so it's a sizable little company on its own. And those individuals are responsible for really supporting the company's ability to attract, develop, retain, reward, and frankly, build a great place to work for all of our associates. We also are really an academy for talent. We estimate that 20% of the U.S. workforce has worked for us some point in time. They go off and do incredible things, hopefully with us. But if not, they might be one of the 70 CEOs that are currently exist because they worked at Walmart before they went on to be a CEO. So we're a very, very big academy for talent. And increasingly, Lars, I like to think that we're an academy for incredible people talent. Yeah. Well, I want to kind of unpack that a little bit because when you're, you know, obviously you just described like the scale that you're operating at, at Walmart is unlike the scale that, you know, most, if any, you know, HR leaders have to operate at. And what I really appreciate about your, we will get into this moment in the morning moment when we talk about generative AI, but um, I appreciate the fact that, you know, it would be easy in an environment that complex and that large and that globally distributed to focus on, you know, core HR. Uh, and obviously you do that, but it would be easy to stop there, but you don't stop there. I think innovation, you mentioned, you know, kind of that digital sensibility and product sensibility that you brought over from Adobe um, and you carry with you today in terms of some of your people mandates at Walmart. And so I would love to just get a sense, like when you think about HR innovation and digital innovation at the scale that you operate, where do you even start? How, how do you kind of prioritize? What are the things that you, you want your team to kind of focus and begin experimenting with that might actually be something that would be able to be rolled out uh, org wide or to sizable parts of the population? Yes, that's a great question, Lars. I, I think one of the challenges that we have at our size and scale is not only is it big for us, but it's big for a lot of our partners. So often when we try to work with um, really great technology companies, the reality is we're the largest customer and sometimes they just can't actually fit all the requirements that we have. They've never dealt with size um, the way that we have size and we have a very diversified workforce all the way from frontline associates to experts in respective specialized fields like doctors and dentists work for us, optometrists, pharmacists, etc. So simply put, our first and foremost priority is to help to streamline the work lives of our associates and to equip our associates with tools to make their jobs 
more delightful, I'll basically say. And so what that means is removing, and I've used this term a few times, but removing the friction for how I actually navigate. If I'm in a frontline role, that means that it's really easy for me to actually accomplish my tasks because I have something in my hand that allows me to actually do my work. But that same device and that same app allows me to look at my schedule, clock in, clock out, look at learnings, look at a potential new opportunity. And so what we did and what we've done is started with looking at our back end and solidifying it. And I, I would say that um, when I arrived, we had a core HR system that had only been delivered to 100,000 people. That's not really great. Today, yeah. we have a core HR system that serves all of the U.S. and Canada. And then we have other core systems that serve all of our other markets. Next year, our big leap will be to solidify, to bridge um, that North America, and I shouldn't even call it North America, US and Canada with the rest of the world. And on top of that, we're building this intelligence layer. And that's once again, what we call me at. And it shouldn't matter to an associate if they have to go into Workday or they have to go into another provider for equity or the payroll system, or they have to look something up in terms of their time. We want it all to be aggregated for them. And so that has become a really, really big focus for us. We have a wonderful technology team, but what, um, you know, collectively we were all acutely aware is that we were really building products. And so we moved the product team that was in technology to be part of the people team. So it's really proximate to those centers of excellence and those specialized areas. So we can decide what are we building versus what are we buying? We'll often buy on the back end, but once again, the front end will be something that we build uh, uniquely for Walmart. Yeah. Well, let's talk about building because you, you'd mentioned uh, how your team's been uh, embracing generative AI to create tools to support and enhance and bring delight to employees. Um, and I got to see that, you know, we, we met uh, in 2023 at the Transform Conference and you were presenting and sharing uh, one of the new tools that you had built in, a, I believe it was a 40 day sprint with your team, which is impressive. Tell me a little bit about that. Like what I, I think generative AI, uh, you know, as, as a tool is something that has certainly took in the year 2023, took the world by storm, but certainly HR as well. And I think that there's so many different interesting applications and use cases, but it's so important for HR leaders to be experimenting with this now. Like the time is, is now, time was yesterday, but it's certainly now as well, because this is gonna have a dramatic impact on many things that we do. How do you think about like specifically a tool like generative AI, like when that idea came across your desk to build and pilot a new tool, how do you think about leveraging tools like generative AI specifically um, to kind of bring more delight, as you say, to your employees? Yeah, Lars, you know, I, I guess if I, um, if I had to think about an attribute that I have, it would be one to embrace change. And I actually like to explore and innovate. So early in 2023, there was so much buzz about generative AI. I felt compelled to learn more. And so um, we assembled uh, a small group of individuals to go and to learn quickly. And we partnered, we went to Silicon Valley, we spent some time and we came back and we realized that we needed to harness the opportunity for all of our campus-based associates to learn more. We were concerned about bringing ChatGPT directly on campus. And the reason why is we have a really big workforce and we have a lot of data. And we felt like there would be a competitive advantage to build our own large language model. We also knew that if we were gonna to have to build vector databases to actually store all of that, that that could be a competitive asset for us too. And so we went on a sprint to build what we call My Assistant, which is a front end that allows our associates access to doing things like first drafts of communications, product speculate or specs calculations and over time we're training the model to do more advanced things like benefits assistant and we also have a merchant's assistant underway my strong encouragement to everyone uh, that's participating is when you've been in hr for as long as i have you've seen a lot of organizational change and you've seen a lot of change i've seen a lot of change in technology in my career and what I've come to learn is we are best poised when we're in a position of strength, when we're a pace car to that change. 
as opposed to running behind the bumper, trying to figure out what that's going to mean for the organizational design for jobs and for people, I would strongly encourage all of us to be in a position of strength. Now here at Walmart, we're a little bit of a different size and scale. One could say that could make it more difficult. I like to think that that's actually a competitive advantage for us is to be really nimble, to use all of our people as power, really be people led. And in our case, it was to build something to market so that we could all start playing with it and figuring out how it really was going to change jobs going forward. Yeah, and I'm curious, like when you think about there, there's so many use cases for generative AI and obviously the one you talked about uh, supporting employees is a, is a very powerful one. What Are there any kind of HR or people use cases that you're excited about kind of experimenting with generative AI in your team or perhaps that you're using now? I think there's a ton. So when I think of uh, the ease by which of doing something like pulling together job specifications, helping to put together data and insights how to actually frame a performance discussion for someone, how to actually consider how you could use it as a tool to make your managers more effective and or to develop content for learning. We actually have identified across our centers of excellence. So when I think of talent and rewards and learning and leadership, associate relations, a bunch of different use cases. And um, what we're focused on is building those use cases to actually be actionable for our own associates within people and then ultimately for associates across the enterprise. Yeah. I mean, it's exciting days. So I'm, I'm, I appreciate, again, as you mentioned, just the, the size and scale and complexity that you're operating, um, you know, that there's advantages, there's disadvantages, but either way, it's not holding you back from experimenting. And I think that that's the ethos that people leaders need to have in this new environment where change is just constant. Uh, and as we see emerging technology is we, we've got to be leading from the front. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I just appreciate your stance on that. Um, a question I would love to get your perspective on, you know, the, the role you mentioned your, you know, years of experience in HR and you've seen the evolution of the CPO role over that time and obviously the field at large and that evolution is still continuing to this day at an accelerating pace. And so the, the skills needed to be successful as a CPO, uh, even today are very different than they were five years ago. Um, what advice, you know, there's a lot of listeners and viewers of the podcast who are, uh, either first time heads of people or emerging heads of people that might be their next role. What advice do you have for the next generation of HR and people leaders uh, who are following your footsteps? Well, one, I'd say it's such an exciting field. And I think what makes it exciting is the fact that it does continue to change and evolve. But it can go one of two ways. One, it can become a critical enabler for an organization's success. Or the other, it can be automated out. And that's a very stark contrast. And why I say that's a stark contrast, and I firmly don't believe that it's going to go the way of the dinosaur, is that we need to first and foremost be business leaders. That's the most important attribute, and I think more so now than ever before. When you think about the evolution of the function, it's always being focused on the success of an organization and people. And so what I would really encourage all individuals to think about is what role they're playing as business leaders around that table. If you want the outcome to be great people outcomes, it has to start with a great business advantage. And that's the, the roles that we're all in, in my opinion, is all about organizational success and the strategy of the company and unlocking the potential of people to actually deliver on your business. You can't roll out great programs if your company is not successful. And so first and foremost, how do you learn the business of your business? And how do you take the lens that every program and initiative that you're driving actually has business outcomes? The next thing I would do is in doing that, what are you providing to your associates that really contribute to a great place for them to work? And frankly, retention. I mean, retention yeah. is, it might sound boring, it is not boring. Our jobs are all about attracting great people into an organization and frankly, growing their capabilities and hopefully keeping them in the enterprise so that they can add more value over time and frankly, gain a lot of value in terms of learning and earning. And then I think ultimately our jobs are helped to shape the future of what an organization becomes. And so I think it's a super exciting time 
But when I have individuals ask me, you know, why do you think you're in the job that you are in today? I'll say, number one, I was never, ever afraid to take on a lot of work. Um, there were so many people smarter than me, but not a lot that probably worked as hard. And I'll just be very frank. So one, you got to work hard. Two is you have to know how to build relationships. This is a people business. And if you're not somebody that people enjoy working with, if you're not credible, if you're not accessible, if you're not a role model to belonging, equity, diversity, and inclusion, then this is probably not the function for you. So really embrace the people entities and be somebody that really knows the business. You know, I, I look at rewards jobs. If there was two bookends, rewards and talent, very important expertise to become a chief people officer. And that's because you got to know who to bring into an organization and you have to know what it's costing to have those individuals perform. And so those would be some of the pieces of advice. Work really hard, really be a people person, lean into accessibility for everyone, and then continue to hone your skills specific to some functional demands or areas that actually provide value to the business. Yeah. I mean, I really appreciate you bringing it back to the business because I think that that is kind of first principles now for effective uh, people leadership. It, it's you, we have to we have to expand our skill set and our impact and our frame you know the way we frame our mindset and our work and priorities in that way. Um, I want to come back to one thing. We you know we had a chance to catch up a little bit before we started recording, uh, and one of the topics that we covered on was kindness. And, uh, you know, I certainly, uh, very much align with kind of how you frame that, but I'd love to have you just expand for our, our audience now. Like, what do you see as the role of kindness? We're recording this at the end of 2023. This will be airing in early 2024. It's a new year opportunity to reset for a lot of people. What, what role does kindness play in how we should be thinking about our work in HR? You know, I think, Lars, the last number of years have been really, really challenging for individuals. We've talked a lot about where people work. We've talked a lot about emotional and mental health and well-being. And we realize that there's a lot of um, strains across the globe, whether it be Ukraine and Russia, whether it be Israel and Hamas, whether it be here in the United States and people's concerns around uh, the political election upcoming and what will happen or the lack of candidacy, et cetera. I think all of us have the opportunity to really spark kindness. And I wonder if we all united around the, the fundamental belief that being nice is actually really, really beneficial and that being kind to somebody actually could be the only dose of kindness that they may have received in a day or in a week or in a month, maybe even in the year how that could actually change how collectively society behaves. And, you know, rightly or wrongly, we're in a people business here at Walmart. We see a lot of customers. We see a lot of people who are frankly pretty miserable. And I often wonder if they were found and greeted with actual acts of kindness, if that actually might change their outlook. And so as people leaders and as people contributors and individuals in the function, what can we do to actually role model that being kind isn't a nice to have, it's a need to have. In a society that has acute issues relative to health and well-being, if we don't start with a place of sincere appreciation, then it's pretty hard to expect different outcomes. And so I know I'm choosing my word for the year ahead and it's all going to be about being kind. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate your leadership in kindness. I will happily join you in that endeavor. And uh, Donna, it's been really fascinating to spend some time with you, get to know more about your career, your work at Walmart. Um, I want to leave you with one question, and that is, what is bringing you joy lately? Oh, you know, what brings me joy is the opportunity to have impact. And I'm fortunate that each day there's something that comes across that allows me to do it. But close to the holidays, I'd be remiss not to say, Lars, that joy will come in spending really valuable time with my family. And um, I've always believed in work hard, play hard. And so this time of the year is the time of year when I really embrace being uh, with those that I love very, very dearly. So I'm looking forward to it. Great. Well, Donna, thanks so much for spending some time with us on the podcast and giving us a window into your world. Awesome. Thanks very much for having me, Lars. I appreciate it.